Well, hello there, and welcome to the Rock Antenna stage. My name is David, um, David Löwe. I'm gonna just quickly, like a bit of a small German introduction, then we'll switch to English, all right? Sure, all right. yeah. Äh, genau, David Löwe von Rock Antenne. Wer uns nicht kennt, äh, Radiosender deutschlandweit über DAW Plus. Ähm, ich moderiere auf Rock Antenne und wir sind dieses Jahr das erste Mal dabei auf der Guitar Summit. Freuen uns sehr, dass wir hier auf der Rock Antenne Bühne euch Interviews präsentieren dürfen, Gear Talk wie gerade eben schon und wir werden eben selbst auch ein paar Interviews führen und deswegen freue ich mich jetzt sehr über meinen ersten Gast. Um, now I'm going to switch to English. <laughs> right on. <laughs> yeah. And I would like to start off with a quote. Uh, Tobias Feuer of Ghost said he's the sort of person who plays five hours every day. He's so amazingly talented. He can play circles around anything that I put on tape and he can do it with flair. I would like to have a warm welcome to Frederick Okerson of Opeth. Thank you. I don't deserve those words, but thank you, Tobias. <laughs> I just talked to him before I went here, actually. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, I was just about to leave my room and then he called, like, I'm stressed. <laughs> <laughs> so, the first obvious question. Do you play five hours every day? Some days, yeah, I do. But um, I also have a daughter and sometimes life takes up a lot of time. But I try to play as much as possible every yeah. day. Yeah. But sometimes you play in different ways. It could be that you need to rehearse songs with Opeth, preparing for a tour. Then you're mainly, that's more like pre uh, rehearsing songs. It, it doesn't lead to development, like studying other styles or stuff like that, learning, try to create new licks and stuff. But the most creative part of playing, I think, is when you, when I record solos, if you're talking about solos, then you have to be inventive and, and try to come up with new stuff. That's one thing that I feel like I'm trying to develop as a guitarist when I do that. Do you feel like you have to practice to stay sharp or do you practice to improve? both it also one part is maintenance because you want this guy this hand to talk to that hand and they need to be in sync and uh, to, to a certain point it's also i wouldn't say athletic but you need to have your daily routines to you know it, it would make life easier the day you're going to be on stage if you maintain your playing you can maintain it and you can develop two kind of different parts, I think, of guitar playing. So uh, both of them is needable. Do you, when you play every day, do you do warm-ups before you like plunge into whatever you do it is that day? The perfect morning for me is when my family is still asleep and I get up six in the morning and it's dead quiet and that's when your brain is super crisp. I just sit in the couch, maybe watching morning news on TV and I usually just play maybe a blues just try to play over different chords and then I have two Paganini pieces that me and my friend learned when we were kids one called Multo Perpetu and one called the, the one of the Capricci's the 16th Capricci and those I still like to do it's a great warm-up I, I don't have to play them super fast but it's good for coordination and it's a a lot of big intervals and, uh, well, basically you're playing melodies. It's not just running scales up and down. It's way more trickier and it's a good warm up for me. But yeah, it could be that and it could be, I have a friend who's still guitar nerding out. He comes over, He's, he knows a bit more of jazz and stuff like that, that I feel I, I'm still a schoolboy, you know. But that's also what's fun with guitar. You can always, you know, get better. So it's endless, you know. I mean, we have this guitar here. If there was one kind of like warm-up practice that you would recommend to to guitar players, could you show us? Yeah, I mean, there's plenty of them, but one practice um, I tend to do in the morning is it's basically like a alternate picking practice thing, so I can play the. Okay. It's a bit... 
Não logo. It's basically in three parts. Then you have the last third part is. So I try to play it slowly and then the double up the speed, the second round. I haven't warmed up, as you can tell. So that's one, one thing, you know. Good. Also, doing it like legato exercise, like... And with a pinky. Stuff like that, and... Um, yeah. It's, do, you, yeah. do you do these warm-ups before you go on stage as well? Absolutely, yeah. I like to play at least two hours is good, but at least an hour. Before you go on stage? Yeah. Then usually I go through the, all the songs once, even though I know them. But it, it, is, it makes me de-stressed, less stressful. And it's, you can relax and enjoy your time on stage more. Yeah, I get it. Um, You've delivered the perfect transition for me, talking about uh, old songs and new songs. Um, because on November 22nd, Opeth will be releasing a new record, The Last Will and Testament. It's the first Opeth record in five years um, since In Cauda Vivinum. The longest span between two Opeth records. Um, yeah. Asking bluntly, what took you guys so long? Well. First, you have the COVID two years took that time off. And then when we finished off touring in, for Incauda Venanum, we did our last show in Los Angeles, a Hollywood Forum. And uh, the week after, they shut everything down. So we were so lucky. We did one European tour, one Australian tour, one tour in Japan and, and North America and Canada. And after that, we still had obligations, tours that we had signed up for. Uh, and the way Michael Okefeld works, he can only focus on one thing. So, I mean, a lot of band during the pandemic, they probably wrote a new album and took advantage of that break. But uh, we basically had time off. I, I, Michael worked on a TV series during the pandemic and I was working with Ghost for the Impera album. So we did stuff, of course. But uh, And then when everything got open again when you were able to tour again. We did two American tours with Mastodon and then we did a few European tours and then our drummer ghosted us he, or he kind of disappeared on us. And so we had to find a new drummer. And now we have a guy called Valtteri Vörinen, Finnish guy, he used to play with Bottom After Midnight, Alexis Band and also Paradise Lost. He's great. And um, so basically to make a long story short for get back to your question we after we were done with all the touring we started uh, michael started writing and uh, it took a little bit less than a year to write the album and then we went into the studio last year in february to record it at rockfield studios in wales was it hard to incorporate uh, Vateri in like into the band because well exchanging band members is always is always a task yeah we had a guy that helped us out in between a guy called sami who actually was ex drum tech so he did the two american tours we signed up for and also a festival summer season and um, then we had walter in mind because we saw him play the track uh, the devil's orchard which is he's more of it i would say like ex extreme metal drummer but with in opeth you need to have a bigger spectra you need to know the prog the more calm stuff and um, tasteful stuff and he played that track which is not a death metal track but he he just nailed everything he really had the entire spectra as a drummer all the different elements that are, are required within opeth you know because we kind of switched him between 70s prog rock hard rock metal death metal progressive metal blah 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 <laughs> etc uh, some slightly jazzy stuff as well. So yeah, but we did three tours with Valtteri before he we recorded the album with him. So he was, yeah, he he just nailed everything directly. And when we went into the studio, 
the first track we recorded was one that we released so far, Paragraph 3. And he just nailed it on the first take. So we, that's it. But he was, of course, as I would be. No, another one. Uh, maybe some of the people in the audience are wondering what kind of name Paragraph when One is for a song. And um, we both have the explanation because it's a concept album um, from the time from World War One about the reading of the, the last will, the testament of like a family patriarch. Yeah. And um, the songs correlate to the different paragraphs that are being read and the story around around the reading of the paragraphs and the drama and the family. I assume that uh, Michael came up with the concept. How involved are like you or other band members in like fleshing out a concept like that? No, not much. I mean, he's quite a, a bit of a lone wolf when he writes, you know. I get my creative part is doing the guitar solos. So he will send me a, a section and ask me to do a solo. So I spent way more time on the solos on this album. And I last, when we did In Cauda, I did the solos with him, like improvised a few takes. But this time around, I spent more thought to them and kind of looked at them like tiny little compositions within the song that hopefully will elevate the song. And, um, and uh, but now I'm talking about the solos. You're talking about the concept. Solos are more fun. So let's go back. <laughs> Wait, well, oh, yeah, to get back to that, I mean, no, the the concept was inspiring. That well, that we, the, all the guys in the band, that we knew this was going to be a concept album. It's like, it it gives it a bit more weight. And also, when we found out that Ian Anderson's going to be on the album, doing narrations, and also luckily played played a couple of a bit of flute, one solo, and a little bit of uh, on another track. Uh, that was super cool. Then that gave the the concept more depth, really. And uh, but as for us, we mainly focus on the music, you know. And the concept, the story it was the gr basic idea was there all the time. But the, it was really crystallized at the very end before we went into the studio. So it's, it was kind of morphing along with the the writing process also. Uh, talking about the songs, uh, two singles have been released, if I recall, Paragraph 1 and Paragraph 3. Yes. And um, I feel like fans are super excited. If, if you read online what they're writing, a lot of people feel like that the music on the new album is like the culmination of 30 years of opeth, of experimentations culminating in this sound for this album. Do you agree that it's... We talked about the different styles that you guys incorporated in your music do you f do you agree with that assessment that it's like uh, like the peak of 30 years of opeth yeah that's a nice way to putting it i think i mean it has i agree with you it has a bit of the old opeth the bit of the the last four albums a bit of a more proggy era it has those elements as well but i think it's also a step forward and for us it's important to try to make a step forward all the time uh, this album is different in one uh, perspective. One aspect is that I think the songs are more compressed, more restless, uh, but not with less ingredients. More compressed, but with, with more ingredients. <laughs> so it's, I mean, what I mean with that is if you listen to some older Opeth tracks, if you listen to Blackwater Park, for instance, there are sections in those songs that are really, really long. You have the same riff going over and over again, but then you may, might alter the drum beat, which is cool. But this time around, it, I think this album is different in that way. But another aspect of open music, I think, is the, like the Jin and Yang, I call it. You can have a very brutal part versus a more beautiful foresty part. And that's also one important ingredients in the sound of Opeth, I think. And that's still there as well, you know. Do you feel there is such a thing as an, like a typical Opeth record? Because I feel like, specifically when it comes to the more proggy side of rock and metal, that there is always change. There is always like evolution. So if people would say typical Opeth record, I don't feel there is such a thing. Do you agree? Yeah, I agree. I, don't, I couldn't point it out. I think all of them, I was a fan of the band before I was asked to join the band, you know. I think all of them are different in their own, they have their own little life. Of course, they have connections. They're, 
it's not totally unique. You borrow from yourself to a certain point. I mean, absolutely. But uh, they have their own vibe, each of the, one of them, I think. What I found <clears throat> find really fascinating is um, how do you go about writing riffs and solos in odd time signatures? Because most of us, when we start learning an instrument, time signatures aren't really a thing, especially if you learn like guitar or bass. Um, like what what dictates the changes in time signature? Is there is there something that comes to mind? A lot of riffs with open. And Michael is tricky that way. He uses a lot of polyrhythmical ideas. So, I mean, the beat could actually be straight, but the polyrhythmics fool your brain that it's not straight, but it is. Like the way the, the drums, the snare and the kick is placed. Uh, that's one of Michael's tricky secrets. That's the same thing I heard about Meshuga, actually, that, no, it's, it's straight 4-4, four, four, but it's so many... I'm not a music teacher. I don't know the perf exact word for it, but it has to do with polyrhythmics. So you do a, 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 an odd number of beats on a straight beat, of course, like a, like a five or a seven. When it comes to playing these like odd signatures, do you do it? Do you count or do you do it by feel? I do it by feel. So I, I don't want to think when I play. It has to. It has to go into my muscle memory. So I don't think about it. It's kind of weird, actually. Sometimes when we play longer songs like Harlequin Forest, which has a kind of a odd time signature ending, I don't count at all. I just, I've been practicing and I feel it. It's, it's a weird feeling. And sometimes I stand there like, how can I even remember all this shit or this stuff? Like, <laughs> and that's a dangerous thing when you start thinking on stage. So when Michael like demos a song, you just play it over and over again until do you have it yeah and of course playing with uh, us as a community the, the band uh, that helps rehearsing together playing shows is always good of course many more shows uh, as many shows you play will of course affect your muscle memory it, you, it, i love the feeling when you've done a tour seven eight shows into the tour now everything sinks in, you feel secure with everything. That's a nice feeling. But you do practice at home first, I assume, before you go into band practice? Absolutely. No, we, we always make sure everybody knows their parts before we start practicing, so we don't spend time learning riffs or anything like that. That's, then people will get grumpy. <laughs> I mean, the album isn't out yet, but there are already reviews floating around online. Yeah. And I was, I'm, I'm always kind of interested what other people have to say about, um, about the music. And uh, one review said that it is Opeth's final step in reaching the peak of Mount Olympus. And it's the album of the year. I mean, it's pretty lofty praise. Yeah. <laughs> um, for us who haven't heard it, like, musically, what can we expect from the record? Uh, well, it's a bit of a journey. You should listen it through to it from the first song to the last. And um, like when I was younger, I listened to Iron Maiden. I always loved to read the lyrics while I listened to the album. Had my vinyl. And I think you should do that with this album. Uh, it's going to be a vinyl edition with the actual testament printed kind of thing. Uh, if you're into that stuff, you know, that's cool. Uh, but I think every song is unique on its own. And I don't think there's any fillers on the album. Every song serves a purpose on the album, really. It's a bit of a storyline and, uh, yeah, you know, I'm not really a salesperson, but we're happy with it at least. And it's exciting to see how it will be, what people will think about it, you know. But uh, many reviews has been good so far. And we've done lots of press now. I think, I think I've done like 60 interviews the past the last three weeks. So, and the overall response has been very positive. So that's, it is exciting to hear, get some feedback when you've been in this bubble, you know, recording it and learning it and everything. And of course, this interview is the best. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Just, just joking. Are there any specific 
musical surprises that come to mind when you're talking about the new album? Like, I don't know, a saxophone appearing out of nowhere. Well, uh, I have to mention, of course, we have Ian Anderson from Jethro Tull on the album. He plays uh, flute solo on paragraph four, right before I play guitar solo. And I didn't know that at the time I, I did the record the solo. So that was like, bloody hell. And um, he's such a musical genius, the way he plays. His phrasing when he plays the flute is fantastic. And also we have Joey Tempest, who does a guest appearance on the album on Paragraph 2, which you haven't heard yet. Uh, and it's more or less like him and Ian Anderson do call and respond. But all these different voices relates to the patriarch, the father. Also Michael's growl vocals are from this uh, narcissistic father who, who is shouting from the grave on the other side because paragraph one takes place he's already dead it's about his children getting this will and testament read for them but there's also a lot of poetry and store side stories uh, that they will ha have revealed that they didn't know about Are there any like favorite riffs or parts of solos on the new record that you could maybe show us that we haven't heard yet? I don't think I'm allowed to show like those stuff. Easy way out for me. <laughs> Very easy way out for you. <laughs> so I'm gonna do uh, like a um, uh, show. What's it called? A clinic thing tonight, and then I'm gonna play two other songs actually. So I have I have tracks with them. Um, them without my guitar, rhythm guitar and lead. So I'm going to play a couple of tracks, but the ones that are released. When is that? Today? Uh, 16.30. No, 18.30. Sorry. 18.30, when you listen to an open world. And tomorrow I do a master class as well uh, for students. So I think there's some tickets left just if anybody's interested. So that will be a two hour like sit down guitars in depth. What are you going to teach? Well, I'm thinking about it. It's, it depends on the level of the the other guitarists there. It's I like to. I've done a few few of those things, and I like to have small phrases that you can build up, creating longer phrases, and a bit of technique. The way I look at certain techniques, and a bit of uh, arpeggio workouts uh, for that also will connect into theory that you can act actually apply not necessarily as playing it fast but you can use them as a con as a concept for creating melodies as well and uh, a bunch of licks of course i like to show licks when i do these kind of things I, I my goal is always to feed as much information as possible uh, and hopefully everyone will remember it I'm assuming you'll bring your own guitar. We haven't, we don't have it here now. Um, yeah, I got. We're, we're endorsed by PRS Guitars. I yeah. brought that, and I brought a pedal board, and and we're, we're using the Synergy rigs. So I'm going to be playing through a Syn 50 head with a new SLO 2 preamp, Soldano. You've been endorsed by PSR, I think, since 2011. And yeah, PRS. Yeah. Yeah. And you have your own signature. Model. We had them. They they pulled them out, but that was the the SE model made in South Korea, and uh, but they, they're not for sale anymore. But who knows what the what the future will will bring? Anything new down the road that you know? Of? No, not yet. But um, there, there might be some ideas, but um, nothing carved in stone. I mean, it, it must feel pretty cool as a guitarist to have your first signature model in hands. The first yeah, time. that was pure magic, and uh, I was really happy with it. it was, also quite a of affordable guitar. I think it was around 750 euros or something like that. And uh, because the, the high end models are quite expensive. So it's cool to, for younger people might not have much money or, you know, even, yeah, everyone, it's, they can afford it, you know, but it's still a high quality. If I'm correct, they are based in Maryland, in the States. How did that contact come to be? Did they approach you? Did you approach them? Well, for me, uh, Michael had the Opeth had endorsement before I joined the band. So before Opeth, I was playing guitar in Arch Enemy, and uh, I was endorsed by ESP. But when I joined Opeth, I was asked, do you want to 
join the PRS family? And I, I, I said, yes. And we went to the factory at an early point and hanged out with Paul. And we even did a show at PRS factory with Opeth. So we had all this kind of country, more mellow artists, and we were playing the death metal stuff. And Paul Reed was running around like this. <laughs> it was funny. Uh, but yeah, it's, they've been super kind to us, very supportive. And, and it's a very, they're, they're so trustworthy guitars being on the road. They stay in tune, they don't break, the, the intonation is really good. And also with Opeth, you know, we have all these breaks with the acoustic parts. So we, we're using the piezo systems in these guitars. So we have all these two outlets, two jacks. Uh, so we need to have a switching system so I can go from a distorted tone to piezo, or sometimes I use distorted tone with piezo or clean electric with piezo. So it's basically two different signal chains, and uh, it's really handy when it comes to like older open riffs. It could be open songs. I mean, it could be extreme riff part, and then suddenly shortly the acoustic break, and then back. And uh, it's kind of fun. Some tracks like on um, Ghost Reveries, this one called Grand Conoration. There's a heavy riff there, which is overdubbed with an acoustic guitar. So. I, I started doing that recently, so I just add on the piezo. You see, sometimes you see people in the crowd like, where's that acoustic player? You know, it's funny. And it sounds cool. So I don't know where the cameras are by PSR. Is that the camera? I think so. Okay. <laughs> We're approaching the end, and uh, I would like to know if there are any questions, irgendwelche Fragen aus dem Publikum. Anyone want to know anything while we have him here? I mean, I'm sure you can uh, you can also book the master class and ask any questions that you have then. Yeah, more than welcome. More than welcome. There's a real guitar hero, Per Nilsson. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> All right. Any um, questions? Anybody? Anybody? Yep. I'm coming down. <laughs> she was talking to him, no questions. Okay, that's fine. That is like super embarrassing for all of us. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Are you excited to get back on the road with Opeth for the for the new album? Yeah, right after the Guitar Summit, we're going to go rehearsing next week. So we have about six rehearsals, so then we do a North American tour. So initially we're going to release the album on the, on the first date but it's fine because we released two songs so we're going to at least play those live and um, yeah it's going to be fun and we're doing uh, we're playing here in germany in february a few shows four or five and uh, looking forward are you still excited before releasing a new album or is it just routine by now i'm excited every time and especially as you asked before it's been five years so it is a long time and it's you know, you have to get going again, everything that's involved, doing interviews, tours, and uh, it's a lot of action. It's fun. It keeps you on your toes, you know, it's inspiring. All right, if there are no no questions, anything you would like to add, anything that you get going on that I haven't talked about? Yeah, well, yeah, I think you got me there. Well. <laughs> I'm I'm looking forward to check out the music fair and check out all the gear and stuff. You know, you're gonna buy something? Maybe. Yeah. I've heard about uh, this Lundgren pickup. I might buy. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff I want to check out. You know, try some amps and. Super exciting. Yeah, it's really cool. I be, I was here. I think it was 2019 or 18, but it's just going in here now. It seems like it's expanded and developed. So. Looking forward to dig deeper into this. In German, we have the, wo the word Schlaraffenland, which means a uh, land of plentiful sweets. So okay. it's like Schlaraffenland for guitarists. Yeah. <laughs> it's Christmas overdose. Christmas, yes. Frederick, thank you very much for, for taking the time. My I appreciate pleasure. it very much. And uh, I wish you the best for the release, for the tour. And uh, looking forward to seeing you back in Germany soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>